was going to call this video the things that I hate about my Shelby GT350R, but that's really not a fair name for this video because honestly, there really isn't anything I actually hate about the car. So instead, it's going to be some of the things that I dislike about my 350R and how I'm going to fix them. Every single thing on this list, well, every single thing except for one, has something, an action item that I can take to address it and make it better in my opinion. So if you are familiar, I just bought this 2018 GT350R. It's finished in lead foot gray. Had just under 4,300 miles on it. I think I'm just over 5,500 now. Fresh oil change recently. I finally have a 350R in the garage. And before we get going, I just took it for a very spirited, enthusiastic drive. And I'm actually, it's, it's not perfect. It's a used car. There's a couple little chips on it already, a um, couple other minor things. But in my mind, I don't need to make every single effort to preserve it and keep it as perfect and pristine as possible. I can just drive the heck out of it and enjoy it. I spent way too much money and time and energy and effort on some of my previous cars like the RS7 trying to get it as perfect as possible when it was a daily driver. With this car, I'm going to hopefully take it on track days, autocross, and just drive the crap out of it and enjoy it. The first thing we're going to start with might be the most controversial one. I've talked about it before and got some angry comments on YouTube already about it, but it's the wheels and the fact that I'm taking off the carbon fiber wheels. And I understand one of the most special parts of the 350R is the carbon fiber wheels, less unsprung weight, and they're just really cool to have carbon fiber wheels, but they are very, very expensive. Going to a Ford dealership, getting a replacement is somewhere in that $4,000 per wheel range. And with carbon wheels, if you do happen to damage them, it's not really that easy to repair them. Now, I'm not saying I don't need carbon wheels because driving this thing on carbon wheels and cup two tires is amazing, but it has some downsides. One, wheels very expensive. Two, those cup two tires are not good if it even thinks about raining. You will hydroplane when it gets wet. I can take it very slow. On my drive home around the Indianapolis area, I got caught in a pretty severe rainstorm and I had to put wet mode on, do about 45 miles an hour on the freeway to avoid hydroplaning. So here is the plan. These are coming off uh, and they are going to be replaced with a set of signature forged wheels, which are still fully forged wheels, are still pretty light, not as light as the carbons. And I'm going to run some Michelin PS4S tires, which are a brilliant summer tire. Um, PS4S is, is great all around and it will be more usable in terms of if it gets a little bit colder out. Not actually, I shouldn't drive it when it's cold out on those tires because summer tire compounds get too hard, but they have more tread. So if it gets wet out, I can still drive it if it's raining, whereas it's a little bit more of a sketchy experience on the Cup 2s. Now these, it's not like I'm getting rid of them and not running them anymore. Cup 2s are track tires. And when I do take it on a track day or something, go down to Autobahn Country Club or do a autocross event, Cup 2s and Michelins are going to go back on. Cup 2s are also pretty expensive to uh, run and just use them on public roads because the tread life isn't that long and it just gets expensive. But I'm going to change that pretty, pretty soon. The wheels are on order. As soon as the wheels have uh, ETA that's close enough, I'll go order some new tires. They're going to be slightly wider than stock. The other thing is the poke, the OEM width of these. Look how much they stick out from the bodywork. That's just the OEM R fitment. They're 315s out back. I'm actually going to a 325, which the shoulder gets a little more squared off, so they actually poke even more. But Terrence, that signature wheels, is messing with the fitment, the concavity, and everything to make it so it's a little more flush. Regardless, that's just the way the R looks. It's very aggressive. No complaints there, but the carbon wheels definitely qualify as something that I want to change and fix up and make a little bit better for regular road use. And the added benefit is I'm going to have some cool wheels that I personally really, really am excited to see how they look on the car. It personalizes to my my, I mean, my desired appearance for the car. Also, something else that changing the tires out will hopefully help is the tram lining. So with the Cup 2s and them being so wide, it's 305s up front, this car does tram line pretty hard. It will follow every single groove or rut in the road. So you're constantly putting in steering correction. And that's because it is a track focused car. It's really aggressive. Um, it's not so much a complaint. It's just something I know, I acknowledge, and I'm going to live with with the car. I don't mind it that much. Uh, on a freeway, it does get a little bit irritating over like a long trip, but I've only done one long trip in, the, uh, in this car. Regardless, the PS4S tires will, should help a bit. There's some other suspension changes and the people mess with the many, many things to try to eliminate the tram lining. I don't need to get to that point where it's like completely gone, but the PS4S tires should definitely help that. Next up involves the hood slash under hood of this car. More specifically, there's no hood struts from the factory. You have to use the stupid little prop thing. So like, cause I'm one hand on a camera, one hand on a hood. It, it doesn't, there's no like little hydraulic struts. Like, come on Ford, why? 
Why couldn't you do that? That's easy to change. Ford Performance actually makes a kit with the two struts, and I think like Redline makes them. I gotta do a little more research, but I'll get those. So just easier, just open your hood up and it just supported like that. Um, maybe, maybe I'm spoiled coming from higher end German cars that they all have that, but uh, it's ultimately I can't blame Ford per se because it at, at its core, it's still a Mustang originally uh, in cost savings and blah, blah, blah. I'm happy they put the giant crazy flat plane crank voodoo motor in there, but little tiny con issue, concern, whatever, complaint. That is very easy to fix. I'll put those struts on that'll solve the opening the hood issue because not that I expect to open a hood a lot, um, but these things do have oil consumption. Uh, it's a known thing. A lot of higher performance motors will consume oil. Now I drove this car 1200 miles home. Uh, it went in straight for an oil change and I didn't think, I checked it all throughout my, every time I stopped for gas pretty much, I would actually, no, every other time I stopped for gas, I would check. And Ford says every 500 miles, you burn one quart of oil. I have three quarts of Motorcraft 5W50 in the back. Some people have had it worse. Some people have no oil consumption. It's just something to monitor with a high performance motor. And I mean, it's not voodoo exclusive. You look at the BMW 4.4 twin turbo V, the S63, that thing burnt oil. Sometimes high performance Audis burn oil. With a performance car, it's something you just have to keep up with. And having those struts will definitely make it easier to open the hood, pull out the dipstick and check the oil level. The next thing that I'm changing on my car that's fixing something I don't absolutely love has to do with the exhaust valve. So the factory exhaust valve has a toggle switch. It's the fourth one right there. That toggle switch allows me to open and close the exhaust valves. Now, that's fine because once I'm rolling, uh, I just leave it in full open mode and it sounds absolutely crazy. It's insanely loud. The problem is on cold start, the valves will like automatically actuate themselves and it's not something you can, I can't seem to defeat that. Um, I remember reading somebody some saying something about if you put the clutch in, hit the button, toggle the switch, it'll try to do it, which is what I just did on cold start this morning, but it still went quiet and I flipped it open again. So my friend Matt was the one who actually told me about this. The AWE exhaust valve controller works on the valves on this car. On their website, I think it only says for the Focus RS, but apparently the Focus RS part number is exactly the same, or the same part for the valve actuator on the exhaust as a 350R. So I got that valve controller, I'm gonna set it up, and whole separate video of installing that, have not done that yet. It works, because my friend Matt has it on his car. So I can use a little controller to manually override and open the valve. So the toggle switch, will no longer operate anymore, but I have a little remote control, just like any Valvetronic aftermarket system, and I can open the valves on command. So we'll open it, cold start, and it's gonna sound amazing. The other thing is, in sixth gear, no matter what mode you're in, factory, it forces the valves closed so you don't get drone on the freeway. Sixth gear is really just overdrive, uh, fuel economy gear, but with the valve controller, I can override that and then make sure the valves are open on the freeway too if I really wanted to in sixth gear. The next thing we're moving inside, specifically the steering wheel. Now, it's a perfectly fine steering wheel, it's pretty nice, but I don't, I personally don't love Alcantara on the steering wheel. I love it on seats, on headliner, on all sorts of other surfaces, but on a high contact location like the steering wheel, I don't love it because your hands, sometimes the grease and oil or whatever, gets on it and over time it wears down, it doesn't age well. Now, there are ways to clean it, take care of it. My Boss 302 had the same type of Alcantara steering wheel, people with Porsche GT3s or a Performante, whatever, McLaren LT, Alcantara steering wheel, you can clean it, take care of it. I just don't love that. So what I'm gonna do on the car, and this is also an added personalization type of thing that I just want to do. We'll probably get a custom wheel made with perforated leather on uh, one of the portions and some carbon fiber on the other part. That is uh, a plan. I've talked to a guy online who makes them. He does some really, really nice work and you can pull out the airbag and these pieces, the buttons, everything are a replacement. You get the outer wheel, you can do custom stitching, whatever. That's something I'm gonna do. Um, and I've voiced it many times before. I don't, I don't love Alcantara on steering wheels. Um, it's just not my favorite thing. I like the perforated leather. And if I add a little bit of carbon fiber to spice it up, that might be cool too. This next thing is the one that really doesn't have a solution. Um, it's something I don't love, but I don't necessarily hate about it. It's just something I have to accept. And it's the panel gaps. Remember, at the end of the day, this is still a Ford Mustang. Uh, it's a Mustang with a crazy engine, crazy suspension, amazing performance but it still is essentially a Mustang. So the panel gaps aren't brilliant, especially around back. Um, the panel gaps are 
little, I mean, they're not, they're not, they're not great. This side of my rear bumper is actually not bad. On this side, the rear bumper actually is one of the known places that was problematic on these. This one is pretty bad. It's not that even. Now, does it drive me crazy? Not really. I bought this car to drive and enjoy. This is, this is not great. I believe, I believe there is a TSB out that was supposed to address that. They did make some changes throughout the mod years to try to fix up some of these quality issues. But part of that is just the, uh, I mean, buying American, the reputation is there compared to something like, I mean, there's a, where to go? There's a Nardo Gray RS7 over there. RS7 that I used to have is probably gonna have a lot tighter tolerances. Um, but overall, I mean, it's a lot better than the Boss 302 I had, the old 20, that was a 2012 Mustang. This is much, much better. It's way better performing, but the panel gaps are still there. The build quality is not, I mean, it's fine. I, I'm not, not a massive complaint, but a lot of this type of, some of the tolerances in the fitment would probably not fly in a single German car. They would catch that, but with the Mustang, a Shelby 350R, it's okay. Cause if I really get sad about the panel gaps, I'll just go rev it at 8,000 RPM and I'll forget all about it. This one's a little bit petty, but this car has no sensors around it. There's no front sensors, there's no rear sensors. It does have a backup camera cause I believe that is now federally mandated. Like every car has to have a backup sensor, but there's no sensors proximity that go beep, beep, beep. They tell you you're getting close to a wall or a parking or another car or something like that. Uh, and the front splitter on the 350R has a serious overhang. It sticks out quite a distance. And it also costs, even though it's made of plastic, it's not carbon, it costs a lot of money. And you can see mine's already got some scuffs and scrapes, whatever, it's scraped on the underside. Um, it's like $1,500 to get the OEM front splitter, which is, I was like, oh, it's plastic. It'll be like 700 bucks. If I scrape it up too much or damage it, I'll just buy a new one. No, it's 1500. I was like, uh, that's a little more expensive. Regardless, um, you don't really want to pull forward into parking spaces. You have to back in because then you have the camera and you can see where you're going. So always, always back into parking spaces. Something my friend Matt told me, always do that. And I should have listened to him because the first time I parked it, no, not the first time, I scraped it, whatever. It gets scraped um, and it's just something this is not something I can fix. I'm not gonna put sensors on my car, just not. So the way to fix it is back into parking spaces and use the backup camera. Something to be aware of with the 350R. I don't hate it, I don't love it, but I think I'm spoiled coming from cars that had like 360 sensors and cameras, overhead view, all the kind of crazy stuff in the higher end German cars I've been spending more time in. But that's the reality of having a Shelby 350R. And that wraps up all the things that I'm not a massive fan of regarding my car. None of them are really catastrophic. You can see a lot of them already have an idea of how to fix it, change it, um, add something or whatever to address my personal complaints with how the car came from the factory. Other than that, I mean, I love this car. I've been, if you guys have followed me for a while, I've been wanting one for years. Since I first started driving them when they released, I actually... I think I was an engineer at Ford at the time when they launched the 350 and the 350R and driving them was like, oh my God, these are amazing. If you asked me two years ago what I hated about it, the first answer would be by far the fact that every dealer wanted 15 to 20,000 over sticker and I refused to pay dealer markup, which is why I didn't end up buying one. I called around to like half a dozen dealers. Some of them had them listed at sticker price and then I called them and be like, hey, I'd like to inquire about that Shelby 350R you have. And they'd be like, oh yeah, that one. Oh yeah, it's available. How much is it? Oh, we want 20,000 over sticker. Boop, that would hang up. That was frustrating. Now I was able to get one for under sticker because it's a secondhand car now. Um, but I mean, I love the car. The engine is addictingly fun to drive. It's very track capable. I love the way it looks, love the way it sounds. It checks all the boxes. The proper Tremec manual transmission is not that piece of garbage MT82 manual that was in my Boss 302 Laguna Seca. So, I mean, compared to my R8 V10 manual, I honestly say this thing is more exciting and fun to drive. Not as exotic as an R8, but this is more engaging to drive, more capable. And that's what I was looking for in my sports car at the moment. This list of things that I'm planning on fixing, changing, modifying, whatever, that'll be taken care of. I'll make many videos with those, starting probably with the valve controller because that is already here. I'm excited to put that in and get some nice exhaust startup clips because I heard Matt's car on cold start with the valves all the way open and it sounds crazy. Oh, since I'm on the exhaust valve controller, I want this one because I can open and close it still. There might be some times where I want a cold start with it quiet. There are valve overrides. I think 
company called Grimspeed makes one or something, but that's permanent. It completely overrides the valves and it's always, always loud, which some people might want to have, but I like having the option of open and or closed. Not and, I can't have open and closed. Never mind, tangents. Um, love the car. Just took it for, I was originally going to just drive it down the street, park it, film my video, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to go, went for a half hour drive. It was amazing. A couple red line pulls. Um, took it through some corners and roundabouts in an enthusiastic manner. The car is awesome. And to reiterate, it, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like, it's a little bit dirty now. Has clear bra on already. But like, I'm gonna, it's got a couple chips, whatever. I'm gonna drive it and enjoy it because that's the point of the car. And also, it's a little bit lower, lower of a price point than a six-figure supercar or exotic, or even my R8 at the time or the RS7. So I'm a little more comfortable just enjoying it has an extended warranty i am rambling too far on now about this car you can tell how much i love it how excited i am to have it make sure I, ugh, make sure you guys check out the pickup video i went down drove it home that was pretty cool or the um how much it costs to buy the car and all the other costs that have come with it so far hope you guys enjoyed this video stay tuned for future uh modifying enjoyment clips point of view driving exhaust videos it's going to be endless head-to-head -head comparisons with some friends cars i love this thing Thanks for watching, guys.